uh, those are a little theoretical. Those are um, a little, um, yeah, at most an overview and not, nothing hands on. So, uh, you know, relax, um, grab another coffee and um, just, um, just uh, enjoy the show. Um, one thing that I wanted to get out there is a concept uh, that we recommend using to structure data sets if they are used for data analysis. So a data led data set can have any structure. You can create any kind of sub data set, sub directories and so forth. Um, you can put files in any place that you like, but we have a recommendation that has proven useful uh, in all cases where there's a data analysis that is done in data sets. And we call those principles the Yoda principles. There's three, three, three sets of rules that are quite uh, easy to adhere to, and you can find or read out more about them in several of the online material that we provide. The first concept that the Yoda principles propose is um, the concept of modularity. We summarize it as one thing, one data set. Um, what this um, rule uh, suggests is that whenever any particular collection of files could in any way be useful in more than one context, um, for example, um, data in its raw format versus data in a bits structured or pre-processed format, then these files should not be kept in the same data set, but they should be standalone data sets, each, each their own data set. But uh, in order to then still be able to, you know, associate with them, uh, to, to associate them with each other, um, you can install these data sets as what is called a sub data set. I've mentioned that concept. It's a data set inside of a data set that uh, essentially makes sure that one data set contains a version link to a different data set that keeps its history. Um, the uh, next part of this modularity is that everything, you know, should be kind of structured also in a human um, readable uh, way, have a, code repos have a code directory, have a directory for data, have a directory for output, don't, you know, put everything together because that is quite difficult to understand for fellow humans if they um, get to inherit your data set because you were the graduate student before and now they need to continue your analysis. Um, and uh, then um, it is also important for a data analysis that you want to share to keep a data set self-contained. Um, that means whatever is needed for a data analysis needs to be present in the data set or its sub data sets underneath so that you can share this data set as one complete component and whoever clones it has, for example, all of the linked input data that is necessary uh, and that the paths that are used in your scripts to refer to this input data don't include your home directory or a file that lives only on your desktop, but they are all only relative paths that go, um, that go down the hierarchy of data sets so that it's a portable structure that you can also you know, use in your on your next computer, on your compute cluster, and so forth. Um, the reason for this um, is, is um, there are multiple reasons. Um, one reason for this modularity is reuse and access management. Uh, and here's a figure that, that tries to, to um, you know, uh, illustrate that. Um, you, in, in, in analysis, uh, is something that uh, contains multiple different parts. And uh, these parts can either be reused several times. So you may have uh, results from a pre-processing pipeline um, that uh, can be used in several different analysis, um, or these parts uh, are useful for different people or not to be used for certain people. So you may have just acquired a new study uh, and you can't or you don't want to share your raw data, you want to keep that um, secret, but maybe you want to um, share pre-processed data with your lab mates. Uh, then uh, in, by having both of these different, um, different, different um, data packages as independent data sets, uh, you give 
people the opportunity to only clone that package, that data set that you actually want them to use. The next reason um, is uh, for, for, for this modularity is scalability. So I've told you that you can bring Git repositories to their knees by adding too much large content into Git. Um, but there's one other thing that can bring Git repositories to their knees, and that is adding too many files, even if it's small files. And there is that Git can cope with like a million files, but we usually make it a rule of thumb to modularize every few hundred thousand files or so, just to ensure that the tools can still handle the amount of files. So in the um, Human Connectome Project dataset, where we have way more than 15 million files, we actually have uh, 4,000 sub datasets that we distribute this uh, large amount of files over to be able to create such uh, a large version controlled collection of files. So if you, if you have scalability in mind, um, if you have really large data sets to process, then keep in mind that you should not have more than a couple hundred thousand files per uh, data set. And the last reason um, is uh, transparency. And here's a little, um, little overview on why that may be. So consider you are working with an astrophysicist together, you collaborate on, on something. And this is the input data that they use. It's just in format that you, that you that you don't know, like the astrophysicist A001, that's a standard in their field. And every astrophysicist knows that this is a raw recording of sunspots or something. But you're a neuroscientist or a psychologist and you have no idea. Now, if that astrophysicist then performs an analysis and saves the astrophysic specific uh, well-known output format PS34T, which everyone knows is the pre-processed sunspot. Um, if the astrophysicist saves that right next to the input data, then, then you as a psychologist, as a neuroscientist, as someone without the expert knowledge that your collaborator has, you will have a hard time um, figuring out which one is the input file, which one is the processed file, which one is the output file. And uh, us neuroscientists, as psychologists have all the same very weird uh, domain um, standards to, to call our files. How would someone know um, who has never used EEG data that you know the filtered data is actually the thing that is processed instead of the thing that uh, stands at the start of, of, of an acquisition? So if instead of saving the results of a computation right next to the inputs, but um, one level higher in a dedicated data set that clearly identifies um, those files to be something else than the inputs, then you can make it easier for people that do not have domain knowledge to just by looking at your data set, figure out what is actually the relationship between the files um, that they see. And a couple of rule of thumbs when modularization, so creating independent data sets might be, might be useful. Um, one reason may be that there is a different target audience for data sets that could be one data set or one set of data is intended for public use uh, and the other one not. One is uh, for a, for a, for a um, yeah, panel of experts, your colleagues. The other one is for the journalists that um, do not have domain knowledge. Uh, it can be if the pace of evolution is different. So something that is, um, let's say, raw data, factual, it will never change. That's useful to put in their own data set versus something where there are still are loads of things to you know um, decide upon, choices of pre-processing. You may keep that um, in, in uh, individual repositories. Then I already mentioned it, the scalability, um, considerations. So if you have a file system, if you have um, a Git repository, if you have huge amounts of files, then um, creating individual data sets uh, saves you from um, breaking or from, from slow operations. And of course, also legal or access constraints. So if you have a data set used as input, but it contains private data, 
uh, and you have recorded the outputs of the analysis, the RAN on that input data in a top level data set, uh, then it's much easier for you to only push the data sets with the outputs and not the input data sets with the personal files, simply because it's a standalone data set. Uh, so you don't need to you know, um, do anything with the preferred content configurations. Um, the second uh, principle is uh, called re record where you got it from and where it is now. And that um, hints at the uh, provenance of digital um, availability. So uh, whenever you can, it is advised that you, that you link data sets that you have used in order to provide a version uh, um, yeah, event in your, in your repository's history that identifies uh, which data, which um, software, which, which dependency um, has, been, has, been, has been used. And then it's also important to record whenever you add any kind of data, for example, from web sources to record this origin so that it also becomes apparent and actionable for anyone who works with your data set. And uh, finally, and that is also, you know, the reason for this availability check before you remove a data set, make sure that the stuff that you do in your data set is actually, you know, backed up somewhere or shared with others that you collaborate on. So um, maintain this network of availability. And here's how that how that works. So I've, I've mentioned that sub data sets are such a cool thing. I haven't told you yet how, how they're actually created. If you are inside of a data set and you clone another data set in that data set, um, then you can add this little flag data set and then uh, reference. This is the Unix pointer to the current directory here, this dot, um, to point to a data set that you want to register this in. So if I'm inside of an analysis data set, and I clone HTTP example.com ts into a directory inputs raw data, then this uh, data set will be a sub data set of my analysis data set. And what is recorded in the data set's history um, is the origin of that data set, the path it is um, saved under, and also the version state that it is currently in. So if this is really important input data, then the record of your super data sets, so the top level data set, um, that one contains a version link to precisely uh, the state of the data that, that you have used. And if your input data is updated, then you can run, for example, a recursive update throughout the data set hierarchy that starts in your top level super data set. And then it will go down the hierarchy of data sets. It will check all of those registered um, locations of that data set if there are any updates and if so update them so that you can rerun your analysis on updated data. And what is especially nice with these um, linked data sets in the form of sub data sets is that if you don't retrieve any of the data or if you've dropped everything after you have performed the analysis that you wanted to do, then those versioned links are extremely lightweight. They take up just a couple of bytes on your system and yet they provide you or the people that you share your data set with with actionable access to precisely the data that uh, is needed. Uh, here's something um, how that would look on a file system. So you have your analysis, you have you know all of the fancy stuff that you may do and then the inputs they point to a pre-processed data set that comes from a different place. And the um, pre-processed data that actually points to the raw data um, before and in case you're sharing your analysis with someone else, then they can retrieve if they're authorized to do so, all of these files um, if they needed to rerun everything, but they can also you know, reuse the fmi prepped data set um, or on um, the bits data set. The last principle is uh, to record what you did. And that is something um, that uh, hints at the use of those provenance capturing commands that uh, you've seen in the form of data led one. Um, what I want to um, get out as the last thing 
is uh, one crucial part of provenance is, is this one here, uh, in which software environment was uh, any kind of art pr produced by which script. So we yesterday did a data let run command and that included you know, running a script on some data and it recorded which script was run. But um, this lacks a very crucial piece of, of digital provenance of digital information on how that file came to be. And, and that is the software environment. Um, and uh, if you do not yet share software environments, then I hope I have a couple of reasons for why you should maybe do so, as well as some um, hints on how you can do this. Uh, whenever you create a result, whenever you create a scientific finding, some new piece of knowledge, then this will likely be generated from some code on some data, but also on your specific computer with a set of tools you have installed. The more of those ingredients of a research result you share when you publish your science, the more likely can others build up or reproduce your results. And software is a crucial component in that, um, in that, in that um, recipe of creating um, uh, um, results uh, because it has uh, an impact on the results that you that you will get, um, and that you know may be known to you if you ever like run a command and you didn't have the right software environment installed or you had a different version and so forth. This is a cool article here that tried to reproduce the very same um, analysis with exactly the same tools, just on different computers and different operating systems. And um, even if it's the same software and the same versions that are used, um, just running it on a new operating system has a lot of um, influence on the results, depending on the kind of analysis that you run. Um, so here is, is just a minor difference between two operating systems that just had one update in a C library that performs these um, bases or that, that performs the calculations that lays the basis for any kind of math that is done in your system. Uh, but it, it results in um, slight changes in the results. So uh, having a concrete idea on which software was used is a prerequisite for computational reproducibility um, in scientific results. And apart from computational reproducibility, it's actually nice to share software environments simply because software can be such a pain to install. Um, it is probably true if you have yesterday spent an hour trying to get a Python environment to, to work, or if you have used any of the larger neural scientific software, some of the larger toolboxes, uh, any system that you haven't yet installed, it can be an absolute pain to install. So. Um, if you uh, make your tools, all of the software that is needed to create a result that you produced um, available to others, then you can spare them a lot of pain and they can also spare uh, you a lot of pain if they share their software environment. And one of the ways to do it, it will not solve all of the problems. It has its downsides. Uh, definitely as well, but one of the ways in which software environments can be shared is uh, via what is called software containers. Those um, containers encapsulate the software environment, including all of the software that is installed, and they isolate it from the operating system that the container runs on. That gives you a very um, shareable uh, and secure uh, mean to you know, package up all of your software and then send it to someone else who will be uh, readily able to run all of those software without having to install it. And there are many solutions out there and two common solutions that you may know are Docker and Singularity. Um, I'm not sure who is still there, but if, you, if you're still there, um, you can give me a quick indication of um, what kind of um, experience you have with software containers, whether you've never heard of it, um, whether you have heard of it but haven't used it, uh, if you've created your own software con environments. So one expert is already here. The link is here.
Okay, so so it's it's um, we have a couple of experts, but most people haven't used or haven't even heard of software containers. So in that case, I'm also glad that I could at least you know name drop this concept because it can it can be very very useful for a lot of scientific applications. Um, so to quickly um, explain what software containers are, maybe you have heard of the concept of a virtual machine. Um, uh, it is better than a virtual machine, or at least easier to use, um, because it is a portable and very shareable bundle of any kind of software library that you want, and all of the dependencies that are necessary to run it. It is able to run on a different computer system without um, requiring the other person to install the software. So you are in principle able to just create a single file that includes all of the software that is relevant for your specific analysis, send it to someone else, and they don't need to install stuff. They can um, fire up that container and the container is a secure environment that is isolated from the, the host operating system, uses some of its resources, but you know, cannot, um, cannot pose a threat to the host operating system and does not does not um, make you know any kind of lasting lasting changes by installing new stuff. Everything is contained in that container. Um, you may use Docker when you are a Windows user because Docker is a software solution that runs on all operating soft uh, systems. Um, at least if you have Windows Professional, it does not run on Windows Home. There is the only way to, to use um, uh, containerized software on Windows Home is uh, via the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, but Docker requires administrative privileges when it is run, and that makes it an impossible choice for shared compute environments such as computational clusters, unless you have a system administrator who is uh, either especially reckless or especially creative. A uh, different uh, technology is Singularity. Singularity might be unknown to Windows users uh, because it's not available there, um, but it is a software container solution that does not require administrative privileges. So um, I'm seeing it in the chat, uh, nice Singularity works. So if you run containerized analysis on a cluster on a server, then use Singularity. Um, the good thing is that these two um, solutions are kind of interoperable. At least Singularity can, for example, use and build uh, Docker images. So um, you you have, uh, you have you can use both of them. Um, if you have someone who shares a Singularity recipe with you, but you're on Windows, then um, in all likelihood, you are still able to use it. Now, um, there is another data lab extension. So another standalone data lab package that equips the datalet core package with additional commands. And that extension is called datalet containers. And the commands or the functionality it adds to datalet is the ability to also include software containers in datasets. And not only include software containers, so software environments um, into your dataset, but also uh, run or execute any kind of command inside of them. So uh, you can, you have seen the data let containers run command yesterday that ran this, this uh, script. You can exchange it with a data let containers run command, and then your script will be run inside of the software container that you provide, or whatever script is included in the software container will be run on your data. So that extension adds additional provenance on the software that has been used um, to your dataset, and that works with Singularity uh, or Docker images. Um, and now I will briefly use the last 20 minutes um, to uh, demonstrate how this, uh, how this uh, can be used by showing you uh, in a very fast fashion, how to do a reproducible analysis with sub data sets, Yoda principles, uh, data led containers, um, just here on my computer. Uh, let me fire that up. Um, 
and I will try to be fast. So the analysis that I'm doing is a mirror imaging analysis. I will start from DICOM images from an MRI scanner. I will convert them, them to, a nifty, um, to nifty format and bit structure them to have you know, readily usable uh, input data. I will publish that and then I will reuse those um, pre-structured uh, nifty images for an analysis. So the first thing that I'm going to do, and you will uh, remember that command, is to create a data set that where I will put my bits data in. This is going to become a super data set that will hold my bits structured nifty images. And um, I'm going to create a you know, readme about this so that um, anyone I'm sharing this with is um, able to find out what this is about. So I'm uh, adding, adding a readme file to my data set. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to link the input data, the DICOM data that I'm going to use as input. Uh, I'm not going to add them directly to this data set, but I'm going to add them in the form of a registered sub data set. So I'm using the data lit clone command with a GitHub URL where we have pushed um, some uh, example DICOM data. Um, and I'm going to include this data set in my bits data data set and have it registered in that precise version as uh, input data to use for the restructuring. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add software containers to my data set. And um, here I'm doing this in a very uh, handy way, simply by adding a different sub data set to this data set. Uh, this comes from GitHub, it is publicly available, and um, it is a very useful container collection filled with software containers of neuroimaging um, software such as fMRI prep um, and, and many others that, that might be um, suitable for you. Now I have installed the data led containers extension and running the containers list command recursively to operate across dataset boundaries, I am able to see all of the available software containers that I can now use. I have them at my disposal and I can run uh, any kind of analysis inside of one of those data sets with useful software. And none of this is software that I have to install on this infrastructure here. I can also check the sub data sets that I have installed. In this case, it's two. I've created a sub data set for the input data. I've created a sub data set for the software. And those are standalone units that I can flexibly reuse at a later point, for example. Um, I'm just going to run this because it takes a minute to, um, to, to, continue, uh, to, to finish. Um, what I'm using in order to convert DICOMs to nifty images, I'm not sure if you, you're working with fMRI, so just disregard it in case this is not relevant to you. But in order to convert a DICOM image to a nifty image, uh, I'm using a converter that is called Hudiconf. And um, Hudiconf is also capable of directly restructuring um, the, uh, the, the files into a format such as bits. And um, in addition to that, also using a really useful metadata convention that um, makes the bit structuring automatic so that I actually don't have to do much. I can just run um, this call here uh, on the wrapper and convention. It's, it's, if you work with DICOMs, it might, it might be meaningful for you. If not, then please just ignore it. The important part is that I have wrapped this inside of a data led containers run command. And I have included a commit message to the execution of that command. And I have provided uh, a container name that points to one of the containers here that are at my disposal. Um, I have also included a description on which are the inputs and which are the outputs. And what is happening so far is that um, DataLed has retrieved the necessary software. So it has um, downloaded via DataLed get the software container from its remote registered source. And uh, now it runs, uh, it's a little bit wordy, it runs what is called a NiPy workflow. That's the software that's uh, installed in that container and used inside of Udicon to perform these um, 
these conversions and luckily it's done now. <laughs> you can see all of the new files that this has added and I can run a quick difference between uh, the current state and the previous state uh, to see what has been changed. Uh, and in this case here, it's um, uh, all of these, it's all of these, uh, these files that were added. I can also check the git history for the uh, commit that was created when I ran this command. Uh, and that uh, includes such a run record that you've seen yesterday already. Um, but uh, as an additional extra input, this run record also includes the uh, software specification in the form of this uh, container image. Uh, what I then can do is I can go and um, publish that thing to GitHub uh, to, or to Jin. <laughs> I'm going to publish it um, to Jin. So I'm going to just going to quickly create a new repository on Jin under my user account. And then I'm going to um, add this as a sibling as we have done earlier today. Um, I'm going to register it by hand this time because the computer that I'm executing this on doesn't have the most recent version of DataLed yet. Um, I can see that Jin is now a registered sibling of my data set just in the same way that, that you have seen um, in your own uh, endeavors. And then I can you know, push my uh, bit structured and, and converted uh, data to a place where uh, others can maybe use it. Dup, 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 dup. That takes a little while, but in the end, you know, it's here. I have my subject and uh, I have published it. Now, the next thing I'm doing is I'm creating a reproducible analysis. And here I'm using the create command with a different configuration than text to git. Uh, uh, this is a configuration that um, adheres to the Yoda principles or aids adherence to the Yoda principles. So it is called Yoda. Um, and uh, creating a data set with a uh, Yoda procedure, with a Yoda configuration, um, does two things. For one, it applies a configuration that ensures that anything um, that is code is only uh, kept in Git and not annexed, and it creates a couple of um, human readable um, description files uh, like README files that you know urge you or nudge you to properly document everything that um, that you have done and and explain explain uh, the dataset contents. They also have a little you know a placeholder descriptions that you can use to create a nice README. What I can then do is because this is a new data um, analysis super data set, uh, I can take my input data that could either be the local bits data set that I have already created, but I can also you know, um, pretend uh, I'm a new collaborator uh, on, this, on this data set. So I'm cloning it um, from Jin uh, and include it as an input sub data set into my analysis. And then I have prepared a script that performs a simple analysis on this input data. It will just extract a brain mask from the um, nifty image. And I have put that on GitHub and I'm using data like download URL to save it from GitHub and um, uh, to, to download it from GitHub and save it in the data set. The next thing I'm going to do because that script requires a little bit of Python and neuroimaging imaging software is I'm going to register a software container. And I know that some people of you have already, you know, created their own software containers. Um, so if you've created your own software containers, you can just containers add those containers from a remote source or from a local path um, into your data set under a specific name. If you do not want to create your own containers, then you can just use, for example, the container collection that provides you with a lot of um, containers readily readily usable. And by the way, those are containers that Docker and Singularity can use. So it, it's fine on Windows, it is fine on the compute cluster, it is fine on your Mac, it is fine on your Linux PC. And now I can again run a data-led containers run command 
uh, in this case, uh, I'm not calling a specific container with um, which which includes a routine that runs, but um, I uh, execute a script that I have just downloaded similarly to how I yesterday ran the execution of a script. In um, but um, by specifying a container to run this in, um, I'm able to, uh, to, to run this Python script here inside of the software environment that the container provides so that I don't actually have to install anything. And if I share this, um, this, uh, this data set with you, uh, there, is, there is no Python software you need to install, no Python package you need to, you need to um, uh, retrieve in advance. You can simply uh, rerun the commit that is being created right now to uh, recompute everything that was done by me. So um, in having also containers included in my data set, having this kind of modular structure, I'm making it um, very easy for others to figure out what has been done and what's necessary to redo it and to automatically redo it. So here again is a run commit and I can say data let rerun to uh, perform the exact same uh, computation in the required software environment. Okay, um, really quick summary. You already know about data let run. Now you also know about data let containers run. Uh, which is useful to capture and share additional software environments as provenance. Um, you can use it with Docker and Singularity containers. Um, and if you create um, your analysis hierarchies, if you plan to use data led for reproducible analysis in a modular way, then you make it a little bit easier for yourself to access, manage, um, and uh, keep reusability in place. Um, the data let clone command is the command that you will want to use to create those linked data sets. Um, in case uh, you ever forget this little dash d dash dash data set uh, option, it's not a problem if you clone a data set into an existing data set uh, and then run data let save, then it will recognize this other directory as a data set and actually link it as a sub data set. Uh, but that's also something to be mindful of. If you ever clone a data set into an existing data set by accident and then save it, then it will be a sub data set. It's not a problem, but you just, you know, registered a little data set dependency on top in, 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 into the data set. And then there's um, the Yoda procedure that you can, for example, use together with data let create to um, apply a little different configurations to your data set, apply a little bit of structure, code directory, um, uh, and so forth to, to your new data set. I'm going to skip this, but something that I wanted to nevertheless um, show you, because you may maybe you're interested in containers. There are a couple of cool um, resources I can recommend if you want to get started with containers or if you find yourself in a future situation where you are tasked with creating a container. Um, there are some tools that uh, will automatically create software containers for you. So there's repo to Docker, um, which you can point to a published data set that's on, let's say, GitHub. Um, and uh, repo to Docker will be automatically um, creating all of the right configurations for you to create a software container. There is the software called NeuroDocker, um, which is a command line tool that you can use with uh, a number of very sensible um, uh, options to create software containers of very popular neuroscientific uh, software tools. Um, then there's the container collection that I've, that I've used in this quick example here that is free um, for everyone and includes quite a bit of stuff that you may want. And if you're an R user, then there's a specific distribution uh, rocker that makes it easy to make Docker containers with your required R software. And with that, uh, I think uh, I will conclude this workshop. Um, I want to thank you a lot for sticking with me until the end. 
uh, we all made it 